Good morning, everybody. It's another beautiful Sunday morning in Colorado Springs. And this morning, we're going to be studying about the Sermon on the Mount, just three of the big ideas out of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, here's how we do it. Every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, we have a Bible study. We call it Talk with Ted at 10 because sometimes people want to talk about other subjects for a while before we get to the scriptures. It's always very interesting. And you'd be welcome to join with us. It's at zoom.us, and you just put in 719-338-0079 as the uh, meeting ID number. And when you do that, you can join with us. And we would be so glad to have you there. Now, for you to know what we're going to be studying, if you'll write to me or text me at, uh, for this Bible Highlights booklet, this Bible Highlights booklet will walk you through the entire year or the, uh, the entire year and let you read the, uh, all the primary theologies of the Bible. And so we're in the month of June, this, this uh, month, and we're on the 14th of the month this morning, and it's Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And so this morning, we'll be studying the Sermon on the Mount. Now, on Wednesday nights, we typically have a Wednesday night Bible study at that same ID number. It's zoom.us, and then you can go to 719-338-0079 is your meeting ID number. And you'll be able to join with us, and it'll be a delight to have you. And you'll, it's a discussion format, it's not a lecture. So you can participate if you'd like, or if you'd like to just listen and watch, you're welcome to do that as well. One other thing that is important is that that meeting ID number is my telephone number. So if you want our office to send you the Bible Highlights booklet, all you have to do is text me and say you want the Bible Highlights booklet sent to you, and we'll put it in the mail right to you. So this morning, we are on the Sermon of the Mount. There's a lot of material here. We're not going to talk about all of it, obviously, but we're going to start in verse 21, which is Jesus' teaching on anger. Now, anger is an interesting thing. Because there are three primary things that make us unhappy. You may want to make note of these. One is when other people don't do what we want them to do. It, it upsets us. Another thing that upsets us is that when we don't do what other people want us to do, and we care about them. And uh, so that's upsetting, sometimes to them, sometimes to us. And then the third thing that's upsetting is, is when we don't do what we want us to do. Have you ever tried to diet? Have you ever tried to stop a habit or some uh, propensity that's in your life? It's very, very difficult for us to make ourselves the men and women we want us to be. So change is important for all of us to deal with. Now, when we're dealing with anger, it's very, very interesting because of the way Jesus dealt with it and the way he modeled life for us and the way he addressed it in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, here's the way anger works, I think. Every one of us have in our minds an ideal world. In other words, the ideas in our mind about how the world should be. And in our ideal world, there are three elements. One element is the people that we enjoy being with. And so when we're with people that we enjoy, family or friends or, so, or, or co-workers that we enjoy, maybe neighbors that we enjoy, then that's part of our ideal world. And we have in our minds those whom we enjoy being with. We also have in our minds those we don't enjoy being with. All right. Then there's also the things we want or the things we enjoy experiencing. It may be a car, maybe a home, maybe the way our neighborhood should be or society should operate. And so in our ideal world, we have the people that we enjoy and the things that we enjoy or the things that we like. And then we have our value system or our ideas that uh, govern our behaviors and we think should govern the behaviors of others. Okay, now when we look at reality and it does not line up with that ideal world, we have an option about what we're going to do. Most of the time we get angry. Right now we are seeing anger in the streets of America. 
And it's because people have in their ideal world the way they should be treated and the way they should be um, uh, responded to and the amount of money they should be able to make and the things they should be able to have and things like that. And when reality doesn't line up to that, then they become angry. And so the Lord Jesus teaches us what we should do about being angry. And, and of course, I would say you have two options. Some people get angry, frustrated, bitter. They start medicating with either drugs or alcohol or they become violent. All right. And so it's when things don't line up with their ideal world. And when things don't line up with the ideal world, people aren't doing what they want them to do. They're not doing what other people want them to do, or sometimes they're not even doing what they want themselves to do. All right, so if you'll get those lists down and write those down, then think of what the Lord Jesus says here in, in, in uh, reference to that. Beginning in Matthew 5, verse 21, here's what he says. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. That's eternal judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. That means there's darkness in your heart when you do that. All right. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. So Jesus' exhortation to us is to keep our motives clean and keep our relationships clean. And I think he is saying we're responsible for how we respond to people, and we are not responsible for them. And so I often teach the people in our church to read the scriptures first person singular. We don't read the scriptures for the benefit of other people to think how they should be. We read the scriptures to benefit us, to teach us and instruct us and help us live a good life. Here Jesus says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, in other words, you're going to church or you're worshiping or you're praying at your house, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave the sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. In other words, relationships are more important than things. The only thing you're going to take to heaven with you are relationships. And every one of you are eternal beings. You're going to live forever. You cannot kill yourself. The only thing that happens when something happens to our body is that we, who are spirits, we step out of our bodies into eternity. And then we stay on the same trajectory we've been on on the earth. If we love the Lord, we'll go spend eternity in heaven with the Lord. If we hate the Lord and his word, then we'll go spend eternity without the Lord in hell. And so here it says, um, when you are on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. So this is an encouragement for us to adjust our ideal world. We adjust our expectations. We adjust whether or not we think other people ought to treat us a certain way. We adjust so many things in our life so that we're not of hard heart, so that we're not bitter and angry and aggressive and needing to medicate ourselves and needing to uh, hurt other people or even hurt ourselves. Jesus is powerful when he teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. Here in verse 38 of Matthew 5, he talks about revenge. He says, you have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court, your shirt is taken from you, give him your cloak too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. 
So here again, the Lord is saying our hearts are more important than our ideal worlds, than our expectations, than how we think other people ought to act or how other people are asking us to act. Other people will intentionally try to make us angry. Other people will intentionally try to make us bitter. Listen, there is no mystery about how to sour the hearts of others, how to make them violent, how to make them bitter, how to ruin their life, how to make them have such high, such different expectations than reality that they're just angry about all of life. What good does that do? But instead, we, the Bible tells us that we are to grow in love. That means love means living for the good of another. All right. So it develop, it's a wisdom for us to know how to encourage another person's heart so they start serving another protecting another, improving the life of another, strengthening another, empowering another. And you'll notice our economic system is set up so that people are rewarded according to the services they provide. And the people that carry more responsibility to serve others get a greater reward. And people that don't develop the ability to serve others, they very often end up in poverty. And so so it's the ability to find out how to serve, how to build love. Okay, so I serve others by teaching the scriptures. I also serve others by delivering groceries to their house for free. I also serve others by paying their bills. I also serve others by uh, doing the things in my community to make it a better place. We need uh, snow removal and the grass cut in our neighborhood. So I bought a little uh, vehicle so I can do that kind of thing for the people in our neighborhood. And so if you're thinking all the time, how can I serve people rather than how can I get what I want? Or rather than how can I manipulate people? Or how can I sour people? But instead we're saying, hey, we really want people's lives to be better off. And that's why Jesus says in verse 43, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Now, what's the difference between an enemy and a friend? Okay, a friend is a person that will highlight your good qualities and minimize your negative qualities. An enemy is a person that will highlight your negative qualities and minimize your good qualities. And so this is saying there are going to be people in your life that want to take advantage of you and abuse you. Love them. Love them means that you live for their good. Now, it may or may not include emotions, especially if your ideal world has a bunch of expectations of how other people ought to treat you. But instead, you adjust your ideal world. Otherwise, you'll need to self-medicate or you'll become violent or you'll become bitter or you'll become judgmental, or you'll become um, uh, just poisoned in your heart where you're just angry and bitter, unable to find satisfaction in life. You're unable to see a beautiful sky or hear a bird singing or see beautiful green grass or enjoy art. Now, here the Bible says, in that way, oh, oh, but I say love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Now, my guess is when lots of people are angry, they never think of going and getting alone somewhere and praying for the people that are persecuting them or praying for the people that are disappointing them or hurting them or abusing them or misusing them. Prayer is the most powerful thing you can do because prayer changes the spiritual climate around others. And a spiritual climate either feeds anger and bitterness and fear and anxiety or a spiritual climate actually causes people to have grace and love and mercy and kindness. And so every one of us get to determine what, is, what our heart, heart's condition is. It's not determined by external circumstances. And so here Jesus says, in that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For God, he gives his sunlight to both evil and good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is that for you? Everybody does that. Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. And that a tax collector was the despised person of that day because the Jews were under Roman occupation. 
If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So, if you would like to join with us every weekday morning for a Bible study, you'd be welcome. If you'd like to join with us on Wednesday night, you'd be welcome. If you'd like a Bible Highlights booklet, you can get this by simply texting my phone number, 719-338-0079. Thank you for being with us today. And I know these things challenge all of our hearts. But remember the three things that cause people to be unhappy. And remember how your ideal world gives you a choice. When you compare your ideal world to reality, then you have a choice of adjusting your ideal world or many people just get angry. And so read the scriptures, first person singular. Don't project them onto other people and then become the person that God wants you to be. And then you increasingly become a blessing and you increasingly become a valuable and precious commodity in your community. People will love you for your prayers. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for the word of God that teaches us and instructs us. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye.